Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the Marketing Director here at the Academy. Here with us today, we have Shane Trussell, a board certified environmental engineer and president of Trussell Technologies. Today, Shane will be discussing the progression of potable reuse in California. Also joining us today is our executive director, Dr. Daniel Other. Dr. Other will serve as a moderator today. During the presentation, you'll be able to submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Before we get started, Dr. Other would like to say a few words. Dr. Other, how are you? Good morning. Good, Good morning, afternoon. Marissa. Afternoon, it's all these time zones. Yes. Thanks, Marissa. <laughs> I'm doing great, thanks you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name's Dan Other. I'm delighted to serve you as the Executive Director of our Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. Today, I'll be moderating our webinar. And I would like to begin by thanking all the patrons of the Academy. Um, without your support uh, financially um, and, and in terms of supporting the activities of the Academy, we wouldn't be able to do all the things we do. I'd like to go over a few items as we begin. First, I want to remind folks, webinars are free to the members of the Academy. Everybody from student to board certified to those that are more seasoned professional. And this is not possible without the generosity of donors. We're always on the lookout for those who would like to financially sponsor webinars. Please reach out to Marissa or myself and we'll help get you plugged in. Second, you'll note that the Academy is continuing to expand our programs that benefit members. We just published our first ever podcast. We have an upcoming webinar that uses the Pachachka format. That means there's going to be four different presentations during a one-hour webinar. And the event is actually scheduled to occur after hours, perhaps maybe even with your favorite beverage of choice in hand. Our goal is really simple. We want to make the programs of the Academy attractive and beneficial to a diverse membership, everybody from students through seasoned professionals. And finally, as Marissa already mentioned, I'd like to mention a practical item of housekeeping. As part of my job of moderating today, I'm going to synthesize, I'm going to pull together your questions that you're posting in the Q&A function. I can only moderate this if I've got great questions from you. So rather than Shane trying to follow your questions in real time, I'm going to pull those together. I'm going to synthesize some common questions. And in my role of moderator, I'm going to help pose those to Shane at the end for him to be able to address. Of course, this means that individual questions might not be highlighted. And so I encourage you to follow up with the speaker at the end if you've got further questions. Now, let's turn to the matter at hand. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Shane Trussell. Shane is the president of Trussell Technologies Incorporated. He has more than 25 years of experience in our profession. Shane earned his baccalaureate degree in chemical engineering from the University of California, Riverside, his MS from UCLA, and his doctorate at Berkeley, where he studied membrane bioreactors. Shane is a professional engineer licensed in the state of California, and we're Fantastically excited to explain that Shane is board certified by our academy in the specialty of water supply and wastewater. He's the author of more than 75 publications. And today, Shane will be speaking with us about potable reuse in California, the past, the present, and the future. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Trussell. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. Those of you on the East Coast sharing your lunch hour with me and those on the West Coast, uh, maybe starting your day off here with this presentation. Uh, as Daniel went over, I'll be talking about potable reuse in California, uh, the past, present and future. Um, for those of you uh, not familiar with California, we are a state of about 40 million people. Uh, out on the west coast of the, the United States. Um, it's actually the largest uh, economy, uh, state economy, and it's also, if it were its own country, uh, would be the fifth largest uh, country economically in the world, uh, battling uh, Germany uh, for, for that uh, fourth place position actually right now. Um, the Central Valley of, of California grows over half the fruits and vegetables consumed uh, by the United States. 
the the state has uh, got about 40 million people, with most of that uh, being in Southern California. About two thirds of that population is in Southern California. And showing over here on the right in this figure, uh, we've got most of our water actually in the Northern California area, um, and only about a third of our population up there. So we've got a lot of, of water needs in the state, both to meet that agriculture, uh, also to supply these populations and keep this, this booming economy really, really going. So over the years, there's been significant investments in infrastructure to transport water uh, significant di distances to keep those populations and economies thriving. Uh, on the map now on the right, I'm showing some of those uh, aqueducts. Um, so we have the California aqueduct, uh, also known as the state project water uh, system that's that's transporting water 680 miles. I mean, uh, just just the size of this infrastructure that we're talking about is, is something that's really world class. Uh, we've also got the Los Angeles aqueduct that's bringing water over 338 uh, miles from the other side of the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, so from the eastern side of the Sierra Nevadas, capturing that snow melt and bringing it down to Los Angeles. And then to the far right on the bottom, we have, importantly, the California River aqueduct, uh, which brings water another 250 miles. Uh, so significant infrastructure, uh, bringing fresh new water uh, to, to keep these thriving economies going. Um, and really, a lot of that's actually dependent on uh, not just rainfall uh, to keep that going, but largely our snowpack. Uh, so just showing here a beautiful picture of Yosemite, and it probably looks pretty close to that right now. We've had a very, very good uh, snow year this year. In California, which is great, our, our state project water allocation went from 5% up to 30% in Southern California uh, with some much needed uh, precipitation occurring. But with climate change, um, we're seeing you know, warmer, warmer uh, years and it, it becomes more and more challenging uh, to depend on those, on those imported supplies alone. Um, and recently, and uh, we just are coming out of potentially a, another historic uh, drought, um, but this is cyclical in California, um, and we, we have to now uh, be prepared to address these types of issues where we are going to be facing significant droughts, uh, and, and this will occur again. Uh, just showing uh, some some photos of Hoover Dam, where it's gone from being being full and spilling in 1983 uh, to I've got a photo here on the right uh, in 2021, just giving you a, a good sense of how how drastic uh, these swings are, and they're they're very significant, putting a lot of pressure on on our water system. So California really needs to develop more local water supplies, and you're you're seeing this across the state. Um, every everyone is really seeing this through the same lens. Um, this is this is to address climate change and adapt to it. Uh, this is to provide a local local sustainable supply. It's to increase our water supply certainty. Make sure it's always there. Um, reduce some of the ecosystem pressures that are out there on these imported supplies. So more and more as we learn the science around uh, the impact we're having on different species, that can also be a major factor in how much water uh, we can move or take from the environment. And then lastly, uh, getting cost control, getting, getting a good handle on, on the, the cost of, of these supplies. Uh, through through uh, a local sustainable supply that that ha it's better controlled um, and we can better understand how much water would be produced or yielded. Fortunately for California, we have we have deep roots in potable reuse. Um, I'm showing here uh, the Montebello Four Four Bay uh, spreading basins. Uh, this project uh, is a collaboration between the Water Replenishment District of Southern California and the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. It's been operating since 1962. And what these are are significant infrastructure that's really there to, to capture and manage storm flows. 
so a lot of times these basins would be empty and waiting for a good rain uh, where we divert some of the river water that's coming down, put it into these large basins and, and provide time for that water to make its way and percolate down into the ground. Um, well, a great use of this same infrastructure is to take Title 22, so well-treated wastewater. It's been uh, biologically treated for nutrient removal even, then filtration and disinfection. And then we put that water into these spreading basins and allow it to uh, make its way down. In particular, when these spreading basins are empty and available, it's a great use of this infrastructure. And so it's important to note, because most of my talk will actually be on the reverse osmosis, uh, which is a, a key uh, process in, in a lot of our potable reuse, but we do have projects in California that do not employ reverse osmosis. Uh, we're actually recharging, uh, got down there about 250 million liters a day, uh, which is a, around 70 uh, MGD. Um, and what, what this does when, when you look at projects like this is you, you put that recycled water into that infiltration basin. Uh, the regulations are, are strict in, in the distances and the travel times that must be provided. So the, the environmental buffer is relied on uh, to provide additional public health treatment. Um, and that, that's provided uh, by ensuring that there are no wells uh, within certain travel times of, of the recharge site. Just to give you a, a sense of some of the sort of benefits of the environmental buffer, uh, just showing some, some TOC data of, of the influent wastewater. Uh, some of it has just been disinfected with chlorine. The other uh, column has been disinfected with, with ozone, um, showing just what happens through a VEDO zone. So the VEDO zone is actually only five days of treatment, but it's aerobic moving through a soil column. Uh, you can see that we get significant removals uh, of, of that TOC. We then go through a saturated column in this data set where uh, it's provided another 25 days of retention time, which further lowers the TOC. I've, we've got some great papers uh, that are actually out in the white literature of, of multiple years of operating uh, soil columns on, on different uh, wastewater effluents, um, and I'm happy to send anyone a link to, to that information if you're interested. But really, the goal of, of showing this was just to highlight the organics removal that's provided uh, by the environmental buffer, getting us down to concentrations that you're seeing here, such as two milligrams per liter, which is a normal uh, NOM type of concentration, natural organic matter concentration you would find uh, for the, the raw water supplies. Another example of some of the benefits of uh, the the soil aquifer treatment, uh, just showing some NDMA uh, concentrations. So pretty significant NDMA um, in, in particular in the influent. So you can see the secondary effluent has some NDMA, just under 100 nanogram per liter. But then through the chloramination process, uh, we increase that NDMA to about 450. Uh, and through the ozonation process, uh, about 380. So very significant NDMA formation from the disinfection steps. Uh, but very quickly, we see significant removal. So more, more than 90% removal through the beta zone. Uh, dropping the chlorinated uh, treated water down to 40 nanograms per liter and the ozonated uh, down to four nanogram per liter. Uh, and then as you move through the, the saturated zone, another 25 days, uh, you get to non-detect NDMA. So the environmental buffer really is uh, providing a significant barrier uh, for many of these chemicals that we're concerned about. Couple more examples of, of this. Uh, we've got the disinfection byproducts that we're concerned about in drinking water. Um, so things like tri, uh, trihalomethanes um, shown, shown down here in the table for the chlorinated soil column and the, the haloacetic acids um, shown at the top. Uh, you can see these are different sampling events that we do have detects of, of both of these disinfection, chlorinated disinfection byproducts. 
but we find that after they've gone through the soil column treatment, just 30 days in this example, uh, we get to non-detect values of, of those disinfection byproducts. Even with bromate, uh, where you see that we are on occasion getting uh, bromate uh, forming uh, with ozone in the disinfection step for this recycled water, uh, you're seeing that that, that uh, soil column is effective at reducing that uh, bromate to non-detect levels. So moving away from the soil uh, aquifer treatment and those types of projects, um, California really did take a significant leap forward and it, it came with the advent of in integrated membrane systems in the late 90s. Um, so up to this point, uh, reverse osmosis was used, for example, in Water Factory 21 at the Orange County Water District, uh, but it had lime uh, pretreatment, lime softening as pretreatment and filtration, and it was very challenging to operate that facility, to say the least. Uh, the RO fouling was quite significant, um, and this, this was not uh, widely applied because of the, the extra effort involved O&M uh, associated with the process. I'm showing here in this photo um, what, what was at the time known as MEMCOR. It's developed out of Australia. It was a polypropylene membrane. It was really the first uh, membrane filtration process. It's a microfilter uh, that was robust enough that began to change the entire game. Um, so this, this product is uh, now owned by DuPont um, and it, they've moved largely away from polypropylene. Um, but this, this membrane system uh, showing a pilot here uh, was, was one of the, the key steps that was needed. Uh, it allowed us now to make microfiltered quality water, so very high quality water, that could then be fed directly into the reverse osmosis unit. Showing over there on the right is simple chloramine, good old friend chloramine. Uh, during those same time periods, uh, we learned that even though we microfiltered the water, that, that wasn't enough. Uh, we still had biofouling of the RO units. Uh, but around that same time, we learned that, hey, if we carry this chloramine residual uh, through the RO process and microfilter it, we get to exceptional performance with the reverse osmosis process. So moving, you know, cleaning from uh, at once every two weeks to once every three months or six months. So uh, a phenomenal leap forward and our ability to implement uh, the RO process. And around that time, you began to see municipalities uh, that were doing uh, and had these lime systems begin to move towards membrane filtration. Um, so with phase two, West Basin MWD became the first full-scale microfiltration reverse osmosis facility in 1999. So they've They've benefited now from this MF pretreatment and the addition of chloramines and are now running an MFRO type facility for uh, injection into the ground uh, to really provide a seawater intrusion barrier where previously we were using imported water uh, as that barrier water. Shortly after that, uh, Terminal Island, which is owned and operated by uh, the city of Los Angeles, uh, LA sanitation districts, um, they uh, began operating their MFRO facility, uh, 6MGD in 2003. Uh, this actually had free chlorine uh, as the disinfection step prior to injection. Um, and just showing a picture here of, of that facility and those trains. Probably one of the, the biggest and most significant things to occur uh, for, for California, actually for the world in, in water reuse is the Orange County Water District's uh, system. Uh, they commissioned the groundwater replenishment system in 2008 after having uh, done extensive piloting and constructed a demonstration facility. They were now uh, moving forward with the first 70 MGD of uh, reuse water. Uh, this went a long way to show people the economics of, of MFRO and this advanced treatment had really arrived to a new place. 
um, and the reliability of these processes were at an all new status. The cost was now better defined and you could see utilities now doing it at, at this sort of scale. This is a very, very large facility and really an example that everybody could use and draw upon uh, to understand and also uh, get a better uh, vision of uh, what what this process could mean for for California's future. Another key thing beyond the advent of of really integrated membranes and then Orange County is is our development of regulations in California. Uh, this has really been uh, an, a long term effort. Uh, we've had draft. Uh, groundwater recharge regulations uh, since the 70s, and those were constantly being changed. Anytime there was a new project, new regulators getting involved, dealing with new details, they would change the regulations and sort of move the bar. Um, come along in, in 2010, uh, we have a Senate Bill 918 uh, that was very important. Um, it required that these groundwater regulations become finalized and adopted. It required that we uh, that the state uh, engage a panel and determine the feasibility of developing direct potable reuse regulations. And it also required that the state develop uh, a surface water augmentation regulation and finalize those. Um, Senate Bill 322 added some advisory committees and, and changed some of the other language. You can see very quickly though, we moved and, and got final groundwater recharge regulations, uh, which are now available to, to many throughout the state. And that's driven a lot of new projects because with the established criteria comes a lot of confidence that you can plan and understand your project uh, needs and constraints and costs. Uh, so that uh, really has spawned a lot of uh, new uh, activity. Then, uh, the expert panel here in California, they did engage an expert panel uh, and they confirmed that it was feasible to develop direct potable reuse criteria. Uh, then moving along, we then got a bill that's requiring them to develop uh, new regulations for uh, direct potable reuse, that's AB 574. And in, in response, the regulators have been working on this. So they developed a, a framework for what this would look like. They released the first draft. They've released the second draft. Um, down there in 2018, importantly, we've also got final surface water augmentation regulations. So this is the ability to put uh, recycled water into a drinking water reservoir, uh, still in IPR, uh, indirect potable reuse configuration. And then we've got research that's been ongoing really actually since 2010 in terms of time frame. And for those of you that are interested, there is actually draft uh, DPR criteria that has been out and released, and they are scheduled to have completed these regulations and have adopted them uh, by the end of 2023. So there's a lot going on here in California with regards to regulations, a lot of research uh, nationally as well to support the, the, these developments. And really, this is another major driver uh, for the type of uh, reuse that we're seeing uh, taking place here in California. So with these regulations, again, has come a lot of confidence for utilities, um, and this has led to a lot of projects. So I'm gonna be covering a few of those. Terminal Island, which I mentioned earlier, was one of the first uh, facilities to do integrated membrane filtration. They had to adopt to the new regulations, so they went away from free chlorine prior to injection, and they went with UV advanced oxidation. Uh, this is the first facility in the world uh, to employ UV hypochlorite, so instead of adding hydrogen peroxide to drive the advanced oxidation process, uh, there is hypochlorite added. Uh, the pH of the water is very low. There's no organics, uh, so you don't get disinfection byproducts. And the UV hypochlorite process that was demonstrated here and constructed here is really kind of taken off uh, in potable reuse and uh, is, is what you see most of the time now actually being installed and used. And this is the first facility just showing actually this is one of the UV trains. Uh, this one here is capable of treating uh, 12 MGD of flow. 
Orange County's continued their good work. Um, they've gone through two expansions, uh, an interim expansion to 100 MGD, and they are currently uh, starting up and finishing up their what they refer to as the final expansion. Uh, so this takes the plant to 130 MGD. Uh, this is the largest reuse facility in the world um, and really is, is sort of the gold standard for our industry. Uh, out, outstanding team, outstanding job. Um, and really something that all, all the other uh, utilities planning and thinking about reuse can, can look to and learn from. Another significant project is, again, by the Water Replenishment District. So I mentioned them earlier. They've, they've got that joint project where they spread Title 22 water. Uh, this, this is an advanced treatment facility known as the Albert Robles Center. Uh, it's about 14 MGD in capacity just showing uh, some of the beautiful buildings related to it and the outside. Um, it has a very nice educational center. Um, some of the things that are unique to this facility, it's the first facility that is, is direct piped. So there are no tanks in between the microfiltration or ultrafiltration process and the downstream reverse osmosis or RO processes. So there's definitely some advantages um, to that in terms of footprint and cost. And then there's maybe also some other balancing things when you look at operations, but definitely a first of its kind uh, to be uh, up and operating without, without tanks in between uh, the unit processes. This facility also operates at one of the highest recoveries currently uh, in California, which is a RO recovery of 92%. So uh, if we're feeding it 100 gallons, 92 uh, gallons of that is product water, and there's only eight gallons generated as the salty uh, byproduct waste stream. Uh, Pure Water Monterey has also been up and running now for a couple of years. This is a five and a half MGD facility. Um, unique to this plant is there's actually ozone pretreatment. Um, it's to the north, the northeast here. You can kind of see it uh, behind some of the vehicles uh, or, or near some of the vehicles. In between those, those red buildings is the ozone pipeline contactor. Uh, so this facility has ozone pretreatment due to uh, the challenging water quality from the trickling filters. That's to help the membrane performance. Uh, also provides some oxidation of pesticides and other CECs, which uh, benefits the, the rejected stream that then goes to the ocean in the very sensitive Monterey uh, Bay area, which is a protected uh, habitat. Um, so this facility is up and running um, at, at five and a half MGD, and all of the water is actually uh, going and going into injection wells that were constructed for this project to replenish the groundwater basin. Uh, Monterey in general does not have connections to a lot of those imported supplies I talked about earlier. Uh, so a water stressed region that really benefited from this, this project. Another project that's uh, come online um, recently is Pure Water Oceanside. This is a four and a half MGD project, uh, showing a couple of the features here. Similar to Albert Robles Center, uh, this plant has no tankage in between the MF and the RO and the UV AOP. Um, other features of it that make it unique, this is the first uh, facility to be using hydronautics as uh, the pretreatment. Uh, Hydronautics is a membrane uh, manufacturer, so it's modules supplied by them, uh, but they do not use any uh, water for backwashing those filters. They actually just use an air scour and drain, uh, which is a very unique uh, approach and different than uh, many of the other MF manufacturers. Also importantly, this facility, I'm showing it over there on the right. Um, earlier, I showed Terminal Islands uh, facility. Uh, this is another first. This is a first because Trojan uh, is the, the largest UV supplier of AOP. They've got uh, all the equipment uh, at Orange County Water District, for example. Uh, this is the first facility with their new reactor configuration known as the UV Flex. Um, so an important uh, mark, like landmark uh, as we move forward here uh, in the industry. 
uh, for Trojan to have this new facility with all automated controls um, down to uh, the UV dose, uh, which had not previously been done. Uh, prior to that, it was more like a, a power to, to water ratio. So how much power you are applying uh, per, the, per uh, kilogallon treated. The last groundwater project that I'll cover is Pure Water SoCal. Uh, this is a 1.25 MGD facility that's currently under construction through a progressive design build. Uh, this project will also have ozone as pretreatment uh, to address uh, challenging feed water quality and enhance the membrane performance downstream. Um, this has also uh, been through a public hearing process recently to get all their permits uh, in line. Uh, so they're they're making good progress and will be coming online here soon. This is this happens to be for those of you not familiar with the areas near Santa Cruz. Uh, so also uh, just just north of Monterey, really. So an area that is uh, not connected to a lot of these imported water supplies, and so very dependent on on what what the clouds do and uh, that they need this water. So excited to see that community benefiting from these new regulations. So moving away from groundwater, um, I'm going to now turn towards the reservoirs in California. This is really uh, the next frontier uh, for potable reuse. Um, showing here the San Vicente Reservoir uh, in San Diego. Uh, the city of San Diego has led and pioneered really since the 90s, actually. They had their original project. Unfortunately, that was unsuccessful due to politics and uh, folks using the, you know, coming out against the project for political gains. Um, the term toilet to tap um, uh, not helping us as well. The emergence of uh, contaminants of emerging concerns such as CECs, uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals, personal care products began to be detected at those times. Um, and so a lot of work uh, was just came together uh, to really make this challenging. San Diego continued these efforts and continued the push, and uh, I'll be talking about that in a minute, but that's really the impetus for these, these regulations that have been created uh, was, was San Diego's efforts, and it was originally uh, to go into this very large reservoir here, uh, San Vicente. San Diego is under construction right now, and I'll show a picture of that, uh, of what they call the North City uh, Project. Um, and this is the North City Pure Water Treatment Train. It's a 34 MGD facility. It takes tertiary water from a wastewater treatment plant that's nitrifying and denitrifying, then ozone disinfects and oxidizes that wastewater, provides AOP as well. Then it goes through BAC uh, to remove uh, the disinfection byproducts and some of the TOC. Then goes to MF, RO, and UV advanced oxidation. Uh, we then add some minerals back to the water because it's too aggressive. And then it's transmitted in a pipeline where we, it undergoes free chlorine disinfection to Miramar Reservoir. Um, at the time, San Diego was negotiating getting into this smaller reservoir instead of San Vicente. It was unclear where the regulators were going to place San Diego, uh, whether that was going to be uh, under the emerging direct potable reuse regulations or whether they were going to allow them into the indirect potable reuse regulations. In the end, there's additional requirements for San Diego, but they've they classified this project as an indirect potable reuse project uh, because the retention time in the Miramar Reservoir is more than two months or, or 60 days. Just showing some photos here of the ongoing construction. Uh, this is a $1.4 billion project that's under construction. Uh, on the left, I'm showing actually pictures of the, the filters, the BAC filters, um, and you could see the, the filter gallery that you could go into um, down, down with the danger sign above it. Um, and on the right is a photo of the advanced treatment facility. That's actually the, the basement of it uh, that you're seeing kind of being constructed underground. The, the membranes and everything will be up at the, the next level, sort of at ground level. Um, and that's, that's the size of, of the facility for the MF, the RO, the UVAOP with the BAC filters back uh, with concrete be actually being poured in this, in this photo. 
So exciting. This project uh, will actually be up and online serving water uh, in 2025. Another uh, exciting project that's happening here in San Diego is known as East County uh, Advanced Water Purification Project. So this will uh, actually treat wastewater uh, also in, in the San Diego uh, sewer shed, the Point Loma sewer shed. This is just east of uh, the city of San Diego. So that's why it's called East County. Uh, they are going to take about 15 MGD of, of wastewater treat it, uh, and about 12 and a half MGD uh, is able to be delivered here. I'm showing a photo of Lake Jennings here on the left. Um, and on the right is a rendering of this facility. Uh, they're proceeding uh, under a design build, progressive design build model. Um, so the design is being completed and construction is already ongoing. Um, and this work is, is out there and being built. Uh, I've actually been going to the public hearings, so we're having public hearings on the the final finalizing their their permit. Um, I'm going to one later today on this project. Uh, so exciting! They're they're getting close to getting all their permits in order, already having their environmental documents clearly behind them if they're in construction. This is about a 900 million dollar uh, total effort uh, as well. So pretty significant projects. For this East County project, uh, this will be the first potable reuse facility with a 95% RO recovery. So every 100 gallons, there's only going to be five gallons that's generated of waste. Um, for those of you familiar with RO recovery, uh, it's, it's exponential in terms of uh, the salt concentration. So it's getting to higher and higher salt concentrations. This will be a first of its kind. This is the highest uh, recovery that uh, anybody's seen uh, worldwide. Um, those of you familiar with Singapore's developments, they're also moving towards higher recovery with the Tuas facility. So uh, they're moving to a 90% RO recovery, uh, but this, this will be 95% RO recovery, which is uh, very, very significant. Um, so the conventional RO will still be used um, so most of the water comes from that conventional RO, and it's got a recovery of 75%. So for every 100 gallons, we're making 75 gallons of product water and 25 of waste stream. We then send the 25 of waste, waste stream to what's known as closed circuit reverse osmosis, uh, showing some pictures here of what that looks like. Uh, this is essentially an RO process that works sort of in a batch mode. So uh, the RO is being fed water, it's producing permeate, so desalinated water, and the waste stream is recycled in a loop and it's just concentrating up and getting more and more concentrated, and then it purges. And so it goes through a cycle where the valves open and it dumps all the concentrated water, goes back to the feed concentration, and then the valve closes again and it restarts this loop. So this is a technology that's really helping, uh, and there's been extensive pilot testing years of operation uh, at this project to, to demonstrate that we're able to reliably achieve uh, these recoveries. And this technology, uh, which is actually owned by DuPont, helps, helps enable us to, to, to achieve that. The last surface water project that I'll mention is the Las Virginas Municipal Water District. Uh, this is a six MGD uh, facility that they're looking to construct. This is the water agency that serves uh, some of the stars in, in California that live uh, up in the, uh, above Hollywood there in Calabasas, Kardashians, Kevin Hart, those, those types of folks. Um, so this facility has gone through its environmental documentation. Uh, it's really also helping to meet some of the requirements in Malibu Creek, which have gotten stricter over the years. Um, and so they'll be moving into a design build uh, configuration here this year, uh, and will begin uh, their efforts to design and construct this facility shortly. So very exciting. As I mentioned earlier, we do have draft uh, direct potable reuse criteria that have been released. Um, those of you that have been following it, this has been a, a long ongoing process. Uh, we have an expert panel report from 2016 that's relied upon quite a bit. Um, 
to, to define these criteria. We also have frameworks uh, that the state had developed um, in response to some of those things and just to lay out their thoughts on the process. And if you read those documents, you can see and better understand why uh, the regulations have shaped up and have become the way that they are right now in their current draft. To support this uh, effort, uh, identified in that state expert panel report were really uh, six, six projects, uh, three of them on pathogens and three of them on chemicals. Uh, and these efforts have all been completed. So this was additional research that was done since 2016 to better support uh, the development of these regulations. So tools to look at uh, QMRA, uh, a project that did the most extensive monitoring of pathogens in wastewater that's ever happened to date, um, an assessment of uh, pathogens in wastewater during outbreaks, um, looking at chemical peaks and the potential of chemical peaks and how to manage them uh, through these facilities. We have observed uh, chemical peaks even with these advanced treatment facilities. And then also looking at uh, new ana analytical methods uh, for dealing with unknowns. You know, even at one point, NDMA was an unknown compound, uh, perfluorinated. Many of us are wrestling with it now. Those compounds that was at at one point an unknown. Uh, so how to think about this uh, as we move forward for potable reuse uh, needs to in include things that we don't know about as we're uh, in these discussions today. So there are major provisions uh, in the regulations that I would classify as in these categories, technical managerial financial capacities covered, uh, how you're organized and the organizational requirements and, and authority of, of those organizations, in particular, the drinking water agency with the wastewater agencies covered, uh, monitoring and control requirements, the pathogen control and the chemical control. Not going to cover all these today, but I'm happy to uh, provide uh, information if if those of you are interested in in reading more or understanding this more. We have other presentations that I can provide as well. So a little bit about these regulations for pathogen control. Um, I'm showing here in the table the major pathogens that we uh, seek to control in, in recycled water or in potable reuse, uh, making a drinking water from what was a wastewater. After a lot of uh, evaluation, these are the critical pathogens. It's enteric virus, uh, Giardia, and Cryptosporidium. Um, you can see that for groundwater recharge, we have 12 log removal uh, being required uh, for virus, 10 for Giardia, and 10 for crypto, those protozoa. Um, for surface water augmentation, the other form of IPR, as your reservoir gets smaller and your dilution that you can count on gets reduced, the log removal requirements could increase. But if you have a very large reservoir, you would still only be required to meet the 12, 10, 10. But as the reservoir gets smaller, um, the, the, the log removal requirements increase. Over there on the far right uh, is where the state of California is today after getting the research data and doing their own analysis. Um, so for virus, they've moved away from enteric virus um, and have moved towards norovirus. Um, and you can see their requirements uh, have, have jumped from 14 to, to 20 logs when you eliminate that environmental buffer. And for Giardia, it's gone up two logs uh, to 14. And from Crypto, it's gone up three logs uh, to 15. Also noted here on the slide is that you need to have four different unit processes that provide at least one log for each pathogen. Um, and then also, you need to have at least three mechanisms, so diversifying the mechanisms of removal. So not just physical separation, such as membrane filtration and RO and UV disinfection, but also including chemical disinfection uh, to help address uh, emerging uh, pathogens that we're not aware of and diversify uh, the removal mechanism being applied uh, to the water. 
The other important provision that's in these draft criteria is for the chemical control. Uh, there's a new requirement if you would like to pursue direct, direct potable reuse in California that your treatment train include ozone and biological filtration as pretreatment uh, with the ahead of the reverse osmosis and advanced oxidation processes. And they must be provided, the treatment must be provided in this order. Uh, there are alternatives allowed to this treatment, um, but you will need to engage a panel and prove that it would provide equivalent public health protection. A little bit more on these ozone BAC requirements. Um, things like formaldehyde uh, has been observed in, in treated effluents from these advanced treatment facilities and acetone as well. Uh, there's a significant event that's actually covered in the in the expert panel report from 2016. Um, and so it's really those compounds that, that drive a lot of the ozone BAC uh, in inclusion. It's to diversify our removal mechanisms and help to provide removal of these types of compounds, which the ozone BAC removes very well. Um, the expert panel in California uh, added carbamazepine and sulfamethoxazole as, as triggers to allow us to understand uh, the removal and the performance of ozone uh, as indicators of you're ozonated enough and uh, provided enough treatment there. Those compounds are very well removed by the RO process and are, are not actually a threat downstream. It's more an indicator of, of the process and the process performance. Tentatively and kind of as targets in these regulations, they're looking to see an ozone TOC ratio of one uh, and an empty bed contact time of 15 minutes. Uh, there are provisions and conversations ongoing to allow some leniency here. So if equivalency could be demonstrated, projects could go to lower empty bed contact times or lower ozone TOC ratios, assuming they achieve the same benefits. So with these direct potable reuse regulations, there are a few agencies that are engaged uh, in developing projects that may uh, use these, well, that will uh, use these regulations. Um, the first one is the city of San Diego. So I mentioned and talked about earlier the North City uh, project. That would, on average, although the capacity is 34 MGD, it's on average going to produce 30 MGD of recycled water to Miramar Reservoir. That's shown in the light blue up here in these figures. So all those facilities are under construction and actually uh, being expanded now. Uh, the city has commitments uh, to the environmental groups and uh, others that they need to construct another and deliver another 53 MGD by 2035. Uh, so they are currently evaluating two alternatives. Um, one would be to deliver that water up to San Vicente uh, as it per the original plans. Another alternative would be classified as a direct potable reuse project where they would put the water into Murray Reservoir, which is deemed too small because it's less than two months of retention time uh, by the regulators before it would be drafted out of that reservoir and treated again in the Alvarado water treatment plant prior to distribution. Uh, so these are the two major projects that are on under, under consideration. You can see where these facilities are. Uh, we're looking at a, a reclamation plant that's down by the airport there in San Diego known as Harbor Drive. Uh, those of you that knew where Qualcomm Stadium is, it's since been demolished where the Chargers used to play. Uh, Mission Valley is very, very close to that. And that's where the pure water facility will be. Um, and then it would deliver that advanced treated water to either of those reservoirs. So San Diego actively engaged in these regulations um, and in dialogue with the regulators on them. Uh, the next significant project that I'll talk about is a, a joint effort uh, between or a collaboration really between Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, uh, the, one of the largest water purveyors in the country and really in the world. Uh, about they serve about 19 million people. Uh, they're looking to develop a project uh, with LA County Sanitation District uh, that would take wastewater from their joint water pollution control facility, provide advanced treatment to it, and then a significant backbone of infrastructure taking that water up 
passed uh, the, the, the Montebello Forbe type project, uh, which exists shown there in green, uh, and delivering it up to uh, the, the Santa Fe spreading grounds. Uh, most of that water going to indirect potable reuse, about 90 of the 150 MGD. However, 60 of it is planned to go to direct potable reuse. They uh, currently are planning to wheel some of that water over to their existing drinking water plants, so the Weymouth uh, water treatment plant and then also the Deemer water treatment plant. So some of that water will get distributed through, through those plants as direct potable reuse. Just wanted to highlight here some, you know, fantastic work going on at uh, what's known as Pure Water Southern California. Uh, this this project uh, by MWD, they have the Advanced Purification Center. Uh, that's a significant investment for the organization. Also allows them to really engage with the regulators and develop uh, data to support their endeavors. Uh, showing a picture here of a couple of the the membrane systems for membrane bioreactors that are being tested there. Uh, they've generated the largest data set that the industry's ever seen on Giardi and Crypto, more than 70 samples of influent and effluent. Um, and they showed that, you know, four logs of, of removal could be justified uh, through the MBR process, even taking a very conservative approach of awarding only the fifth percentile log removal. So very, very conservative approach still gives you four logs if the turbidity is of a certain value. And if the turbidity is a little lesser quality, you move to something like three and a half log. And if the turbidity would be the worst sort of that you could imagine, even, you know, you've got a feed in RO downstream, you probably wouldn't want turbidity of this quality. The worst was three log. So this is a very significant uh, improvement in our ability to uh, get credit for the membrane bioreactor which for a long time in California uh, did not receive any credits uh, for its pathogen removal. And really it's thanks to studies like this that, that moves the conversation forward with the regulators here in California. Uh, the, the last project I'll talk about and mention is the, the biggest project of all. Uh, this is the city of Los Angeles's Operation Next. Um, it will be the largest potable reuse facility in the world once constructed, um, looking at around 200 MGD of flow. It's going to make up about one third of the city's water demand and cost about $16 billion. So these are very, very large initiatives. Uh, very, very impressive to see the support, uh, both politically uh, at, at a local level, but also at a state level uh, for these types of efforts. Uh, so this this project's ongoing and planned. To those of you that's ever flown into LAX, this is the the really almost a half billion gallon a day uh, wastewater treatment facility, Hyperion, that will be uh, reimagined and re envisioned uh, for the future here to provide uh, not only uh, better treated wastewater, so nitrified and denitrified, but also that advanced treated water quality. It can be used again here for a combination of incorrect potable reuse, so replenishing some of LA's big groundwater basins, but also taking it all the way up to the Los Angeles Aqueduct Filtration Plant, which is uh, LADWP's existing uh, treatment facility uh, to allow them to blend it in with other waters and then distribute this direct potable reuse water. So really exciting uh, times uh, here in California. So potable reuse will really dramatically change the landscape here in California. Over the next uh, 15 to 20 years, we're talking about $30 billion of infrastructure being put in place. Uh, when you combine all these projects together, it's really significant and it will completely change the way we're, we're looking at water um, as a state. I wanted to point out because this often gets asked um, in conversation, how does seawater desalination play in our in our future? California also has the largest seawater desalination facility in the Western Hemisphere with the Carlsbad facility. It's capable of producing 50 MGD of, of water and does do that. Um, we've recently moved uh, into a state where uh, 
our, our, our government or the state government here is now starting to more advocate and support for desalination. I just wanted to say, you know, the, all the potable reuse is really great, but we're going to need new water supplies. Uh, you've got to have a, another water that you're putting in to combine with the reuse water to make make everything whole. And I do think that seawater desalination is an important component. It doesn't compete with potable reuse. This is a, an and uh, type process that we're going to see more of uh, here in California as, as things go forward. And so with that, I just wanted to thank you again for, for listening. I'm showing a picture of my goofy self with glasses in the, in the field uh, at, the, at the construction site for the North City Pure Water Project. Excited about that one personally, because that water will be coming to my home. Uh, so looking forward to it coming online in, in 2025. So thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks, Shane. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. If you want to uh, maybe take down the share, I don't know if you can do that one. And then it'll be yeah. us going side by side. There, there we go. go. Fantastic. So, you know, I don't know if you're a pen and paper person, but I, 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 we've had a lot of questions and I kind of put them into five categories. So just to kind of help orient. So there's some questions about the past and the spreading basins. So yeah. there's some questions around disinfection byproducts and, you know, NDMA and that was kind of in the technical space. There's some detailed questions about some of the current technologies, particularly the, the Trojan UV reactor and how do you get 95% RO work? So we some there. Um, fourth area was around regulations, you know, California versus the rest of the United States and who's leading and who's lagging. And then ultimately on engineering the future. What, what does it look like when we're in that social engineering space, the toilet to tap, but also desal and that whole space. So I've got some, some details, nice. but those are the things that will, that will go through. So in terms of the past and the spreading basins, you know, some folks are looking for, are there any good guidelines for the design of those? Um, you know, have they been studied uh, as large scale trickling filters, they've, you know, they've been there for forever. And, and so when we think about those spreading basins and we compare them to membranes, you know, what's some of the pros and cons and major drivers when we look at that existing technology? So if you can speak to those spreading basins, you know, how do we design them? You know, are they, how are they really working? And, and why, you know, kind of why switch to membranes? Why not just use those? Why not use more of those? If you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I'd love, that's a great comment. And, um, you know, the, the design of these, again, is around stormwater, right? So these are these are largely uh, stormwater management tools. That's how they were originally constructed. Um, and when we talk about, you know, potentially building one or, or the needs around uh, recycled water, uh, we do that based on the months of, of travel time from wells. So groundwater modeling, that defines that you need uh, in California at least six months of retention time within that environmental buffer before a molecule of water would hit a, a drinking water well. Um, so there's been, uh, Jörg Drebis is uh, in, in Germany now, the Technical University of Munich, and uh, continues to do extensive work on studying the attenuation, the removal of these uh, CECs and also pathogens uh, through the soil columns um, and, and in real world projects, um, both in, in currently now he's doing a lot of it in Germany, but he's, he's done a lot of it also with the Montebello Forbe. Um, we actually have also a paper where we operated soil columns for uh, three to four years and that, that's out there in the published literature and I, I could share what that looks like. Um, so in California, as far as like design and what's required, um, the drinking water regulators are a lot, a lot more clear about what their requirements are. What we run into is the regional board. Um, often there's issues with assimilative capacity. So maybe the chloride or the TDS of the water is a little higher than what they'd like to see. And so you run, in, run into issues with um, a perception that you're deteriorating the, the quality of the basin and depending on the environment to clean it up uh, that has, I would say, made these type of projects more challenging uh, in California. Um, but I, I think they really do have a great role. I, um, you know, the more we learn about the environmental buffer, the ground is a really great tool. That's why I covered some of that data because it's, 
are very effective and I didn't show pathogen removal, but it, it, it does an outstanding job at also removing pathogens. Uh, I'm thinking riverbank filtration and all this kind of, yeah, so exactly. that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Now, so maybe we'll move on to the second kind of, there was, you know, around DBPs, of course, you know, the, the United, there's the United States of America and we joke the United State of California, right? So NDMA being one of those, to, you know, you just casually went through, here's my NDMA and what I'm doing. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, for the rest of us, that. <laughs> that sounds a little bit different, but, but, you know, DBPs over the horizon, ones that are unregulated, you know, how do we, how do we touch on that? And then I did, I did have to chuckle there, San Diego at the end of all that beautiful treatment, then there's still free chlorine, right? So you're just kind of like, okay, so we just, you know, it's America, we can't get away from, from some chlorine at the end. So can you speak to some of those D DBPs and, and, and some of that issue broadly when we're thinking about, um, you know, reuse? So, Yeah. Um, you know, uh, DBPs in these advanced treated waters is actually really low. So uh, when we use chlorine, for example, in that San Diego example, uh, we don't even form, it might be one microgram per liter of THM after, you know, you could do a hold time of 24 hours because there's no TOC in the water. So the TOC is only, you know, 100 microgram per liter um, or 0.1 milligram per liter, it's so low that really you don't have that formation potential. Uh, so THMs uh, in general in these recycled waters is, is very low and it's definitely within the drinking water standards uh, and good quality. Uh, some of those projects that are going into reservoirs, they have to meet what's known as California toxics rule. So some of these brominated THMs, um, are like bromo di dichloromethane, I think is one of them. Uh, they have essentially you have to have non-detects. So that's moved the bar up on some of these THMs. So we're getting more and more sensitive uh, to how much disinfection byproducts we form, but it's beyond public health drinking water thresholds getting into new spaces. The other thing I think I'll mention is NDMA, where yes, we California's got their own sort of lens on that. One of the things we've discovered in, in the advanced treated water, as good quality as it is, which is really incredible, we do see NDMA rebound. So when you add, when you've got the chloramines and you take your pH back up with your mineral addition, uh, we see NDMA uh, come back. Uh, so it was non-detect and now you're getting four or five nanogram per liter. Um, so it it, there's there's definitely some things we're still learning uh, about about these advanced treated waters when it comes to these DBPs. Thanks, appreciate that. I was I was anticipating those those are some of the answers. So, you know, then there were some questions that were really kind of nitty gritty technical, like you know this UV flex you know reactor by Trojan, like you know high level forty thousand foot view, like you know what's different? What you know what what makes this different? Um, you know, there's these plants ninety two percent recovery with RO ninety five percent. Is that worth it, right? I mean, O and M and capital, right? I mean, is is there benefits there? So if you can speak to some of those technical, particularly in the UV, UV chloride versus you know UV peroxide, you know, if you can speak to you know what's going on with that Trojan reactor, what's going on with UV yeah. chloride, what's going on with ninety five percent, and is that really worth it for capital O and O and M? If you can speak to some of those technical details there, yeah, happy to. So. Uh, it, it, the new Trojan reactor is a significantly reduced footprint. Um, so they've increased the power of the lamps. They've also got it in a, in a configuration that allows them to easily expand uh, that, that one unit that you saw uh, where their prior configuration was horizontal and they had to go on top of each other and around. And the footprint was much, much larger with the UV Fox. Uh, so that's the old unit, the UV Fox, the new one's called the UV Flex, uh, a lot more general access to the, the reactor as well. It's easier to get access to the bulbs and do some of those maintenance activities. So in general, actually, a lot of improvements over uh, the original UV Fox uh, configuration. Um, with regard to peroxide versus hypochlorite, uh, the, the, the hypochlorite is very sensitive to the ammonia that's left in the water. So if you have a non-nitrified water as your influent, as some of these plants do, uh, the ammonia will be 40 to 50 parts before RO. You'll still see a couple parts, one to two parts in the, in the product water uh, after the RO treatment. And the higher that ammonia is, 
it begins to work against the the, the UV hypochlorous uh, acid process. So uh, some folks still have UV hydrogen peroxide, but most of the projects being developed now, especially by the larger agencies, are looking at it fully nitrified water. Um, and so they're moving in the direction of the UV hypochlorite. Why? It's easier to handle. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide system is very, a lot of stainless steel and very expensive. A new chemical uh, that someone would have to deal with delivery of and a lot of concerns around it as well. Um, and nice to handle sodium hypochlorite because they already are. That's a requirement and something that would be on site. For the high RO recovery, um, you know, this is very dependent on your water quality. Um, and you, you have to understand the factors that drive uh, that scaling, uh, which are not all intuitive. Um, the advantages are very significant. So if, if you are able to demonstrate and get a handle on your water quality, um, the reason it's significant is because uh, it either gives you more water uh, to produce and spread uh, that product water over. So that reduces your costs of the project in the end, or allows you to not construct as much upstream biological treatment. So a lot of these pro programs are actually constructing whole new wastewater plants just to make the, the drinking water in the end. And so all these things are interconnected. Um, and that's why you're seeing the move to higher and higher recoveries. It's really to yield more product from the same investment. So there is additional pressures. Uh, so a higher pressure required, it's connected to that. Um, but that that's traded off by you didn't have to treat uh, that wastewater with the energy required for the biological treatment, which is also very significant to nitrify and denitrify. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So moving on kind of to the regulations, right? So I, I was like, wow, there's like a surface water treatment rule on steroids there, right? You know, <laughs> 20, 20 log removal and four processes and three fundamental mechanisms. You're like, wow. So if you can speak to that a little bit, not, you know, not particularly that one exactly, but just, but just in general, right? You know, so kind of the, the tail that wags the dog, the regulation, the technology, the pilots, the research, if you can speak to that mix and kind of particularly about the unique environment that you've got there in California versus the environments that we see in other places around the world. You had talked about Singapore, you think about the Middle East, think about the rest of the United States and what do we deal with in, in Florida? What do we deal with on the East Coast? So, you know, that balance between regulations and technology advancements, what you can get away with, what you have to pilot out, if you can speak to that space a little bit. It's, yeah, it's conservative. I mean, I, I, I just have to begin by, it, it, it's very conservative. I, the state expert panel in California um, recently reviewed their direct potable reuse criteria and, and responded to the state that really the threshold should be 13, 10, 10. So sticking with enteric virus, not moving to norovirus, um, and uh, just a different lens on what, what the public health uh, protections are. The, the state of California saw all this data, considered it, you know, they have large group meetings to make these decisions and they, they stuck with the highest single data points they've ever seen in literature. So that's how they, they get to the math that they get to. Um, similar theme here, as you remove the environmental barrier, which we do have, most of our projects in, in the world, actually, there's just a few that are actually direct. Most of them benefit from a significant environmental buffer. We know that that provides uh, attenuation of the pathogens. Um, so they've also got a four log um, of, of sort of redundancy or add-on uh, included in those numbers. So they're, they're moving us above and beyond because kind of that environmental barrier is getting taken away. Um, and so they want to make sure that anything that's constructed or operating uh, is is more robust as a result. Um, so it's it's a it's a challenge. I mean, I, I there's a lot of dialogue going on between our utilities here in California and and the regulators right now around these uh, criteria um, because everybody reacts just as as you did anywhere. I just came back from India actually talking at the IWA Water Reuse Conference. And I mean, what a stark contrast. So yeah, it, it's very different. Um, you also see the scale of things that that uh, the state of California is looking at, though. 
Um, I don't think any other uh, part of our country will be drinking as much wastewater effluent uh, as we will soon. Well, it's a, it's a good it's a good segue into the next question, right? You know, because you know you're you're talking about 200 MGD city of LA, a third of the water they need, 16 billion. Of course, I immediately googled how much does an aircraft carrier cost? 13 billion. So you know, we only U.S. only operates 11 of those. You know, around the whole world. So you know now. It's kind of like given a ground truth of the the number. So so how much more do we need? I mean, is, is you know, is this project that's going on in L.A., is that kind of um, is that going to be it for a while? Are we looking at one of those in San Diego? Is I mean, like, you know, what scale are we at? I mean, are we are we hitting are, are we hitting peak build out and design of this stuff? And are we going to be kind of trending down, making up with desal, doing things with Colorado um, or are we? You know, where are we at that whole curve of building out this direct potable reuse and, and indirect potable reuse? And we're still on this part of the curve. Okay. Um, well, so, send. yeah, we're still on our way up. These things, just as you pointed out, are are, are so large. Um, they're going to keep going through my career. That's that's my prediction. Uh, these things are, are very significant. Um, working uh, with a lot of these agencies to get the projects constructed. If, if it's a five MGD thing, yeah, you can get that done. And that's, you know, hundreds of millions and you can get that within some reasonable time frame, five years, six years. You move to anything of these scales, they're at least 10 year, you know, decade long endeavors. Um, and that's if everything goes right and everything's just clicking along. Um, so every, I, I, you know, if I were to predict, um, and and you can see sort of the state of where thing is where things are. All all wastewater effluent that's deemed uh, suitable for reuse in California, uh, in particular for coastal cities, will will get reused. Um, and so that's that's significant. Um, so you mentioned San Diego. Yeah, they have eighty three MGD. That that's an environmental commitment. They haven't said this publicly, but I would think um, you know they're once this is done and that this will be new leadership and a totally new time, they'll be looking to reuse the rest of it. I, I don't see why not um, once you're in those kind of places. Um, so I think, you know, LA's ambition to really just, hey, we're going to reuse all of it is that that's that's the answer. Um, that really is uh, the next big step. And I think your points well taken like hey well what's what's beyond this i'm not sure i see beyond this that well but that's why i brought up seawater desalination i i do think our imported water is going to continue to to play a mix but as population growth continues uh and the pressures on the environment continue i think we're going to see more seawater desalination and that is happening more and more that that's back in the conversation here where it wasn't for a while okay good good Dr. Trussell, thank you so much for taking time out to join us. This was an incredibly informative webinar as we've gone over a little bit over our initial 60 minutes, but um, I just want to say thanks for uh, tremendous information. Uh, thanks for the Q&A. We really appreciated it. And I will turn it back over to Marissa to wrap us up. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, everyone, for all your questions. And thank you, Shane, for sharing your knowledge with us today. If anyone would like to reach out directly to Dr. Trussell, feel free to email him. We can put his email up. Um, his email address up here in the chat, or you can always email me and I'm happy to connect you. We've enjoyed being with you today and we have several webinars planned in the near future. So you can go to aies.org slash events to check them out and register. If you're interested in, in sponsoring an upcoming webinar, please reach out to me directly. My email address is mwaterman at aaees.org. And just a reminder, if you're not yet a, an AAES member, and you're considering joining the Academy, please email me and we can discuss membership options. Last but not least, our PDH certificates for this event will be sent out shortly. And that's all for today. Thank you so much and everyone have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.